All right, then I'm going to go ahead and do a quick introduction, and then I'm going to go ahead and turn the helm over to you. So, awesome. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Okay, so continuing on with our outstanding guest speaker series, today the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab is proud to present Rachel Frazier from the Maryland State Archives. Rachel Frazier serves as search room coordinator for the reference department at the Maryland State Archives, daily assisting patrons in person and remotely with genealogical, historical, and legal research. Previously, she has conducted biographical and historical research for the study of the Legacy of Slavery Project under Chris Haley and has presented at events hosted by Maryland's local county historical societies, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Archives Conference, the Montgomery County Histor uh, History Conference, Brochure College, and the National Archives. In her presentation today, she will share with us some of the resources at the Maryland State Archives. The emphasis will be on those that are helpful in building your family tree and in researching Maryland history, including resources available online and from home. So let's please all put our hands together and welcome Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to speak to everyone, especially across the country. <laughs> so um, I'm going to turn on the screen share um, so that I can share slides with everyone. Um, and we know it when Suzanne and I were testing this earlier, we noticed that I couldn't always see the chat feature. So um, Suzanne can either alert me if you want to chat or if you just want to yell out a question, I'm happy to just, we'll just converse. And please feel free to interrupt me at any point during the, the presentation. Okay, so let's make sure the screen share works here. Okay. Okay, make sure this comes up for everyone. Okay, does everyone see the slide that's up? Yes, it's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so this is the, the Maryland State Archives, the building the way it looks today. I'm gonna, um, of course, we'll be talking about genealogical and historical records at the Maryland State Archives with a focus on what you can get to home outside of the archives. But first, here's a little history of the Maryland State Archives. We date back to 1935. So we date back to 1935. Our original building was a small building in historic downtown Annapolis, and it had 18,000 um, cubic feet of archival material. And we thought that it would house materials till the year 2000, but it ran out of space in 1969. So we built this building here just outside historic downtown Annapolis, and it was built in 1984. Um, it, at the time that it was built, it was the second largest installation of storage exceeded only by the Library of Congress. We had 160,000 cubic square feet, or cubic feet, and we still ran out of space in the year 2000. So we have uh, records here on site, four floors, but we also have a huge offsite warehouse for modern court records. Um, and I'll explain why our holdings are so vast uh, in a second. But um, so the reason that our holdings are so gigantic is our mission as an agency is to be the central depository for government records of current value. And since the since Maryland goes back as a colony to 1632. Our records are quite vast, um, and we go up to the modern day for a lot of things well into the 2000s. Um, so we focus on government records. We also have special collections, which are non-government records, which I'll talk about. Okay. One second here. I have a little bit of a delay. Hold on one second here. I think it might be my, my webcam. Okay, so what I'm showing is just a tiny glimpse into what we have on site. We have some exhibitions going on, focusing on Frederick Douglass. In our stacks, they're temperature controlled, four floors and also at the warehouse, um, where we have, for instance, probate records. Um, are what's shown on the photograph there. But we also deal with uh, born digital records, and that's what a lot of archivists are worried about in the modern day of how do, you, how do you preserve emails and text messages and floppy disks and things like that. 
Okay, so moving on. Um, since we're really going to focus on genealogy and history today, um, we have both primary and secondary sources here. We do have a small library with uh, published sources, but we focus mainly on primary. And primary sources are a good definition is an account of any event recorded by an eyewitness. So that can include for government records, it can be vital records, which are birth, death, and marriage, but it can also be records for when someone passes away for their estate, like wills and inventories, so like probate records. But we also have court records that include land records, court cases, we have some military records for Civil War and Revolutionary War, so those are all considered primary sources. For our non-government records that are special collections, some of our most popular collections for genealogy and history are maps to help you see where someone lived, uh, historical newspapers, historical photographs, religious records like baptisms, burial records and things, personal letters and journals. So there's so many things that can fall under our mission of preserving Maryland's history. Um, I do wanna delve into a lot of those, but I do want to highlight that when you're at home, a rule of thumb with what you can access of our records are you can get to scanned name indexes from home. We currently have limited funding. We're continually pushing for more funding as an agency, but we're not fully funded by tax dollars. So we're applying the funding we have right now mainly to indexes to get those online as quick as possible. Currently, most of our actual records um, are available just in person or by order, but there are some really great exceptions that I'll talk about. Um, and when I mention name indexes, they're lists by name that usually reference a date that something occurred and give you sometimes a little extra information that can still be very helpful from home. Um, now, what I usually recommend as a reference archivist, and that means I'm the person along with my colleagues who helps people brainstorm the best kind of record to help you when you're trying to solve a genealogical problem or an historical research problem. Um, I usually try to suggest that if you can try to keep track of uh, what is your number one burning question? Do you have names and dates and things like that that will help you and locations that will help you um, kind of focus your research? And that's part of my job. You don't have to know the exact dates and locations, but it helps if you have a general, a general idea. Um, now, unlike Ancestry.com, which I'm sure a lot of, how many of you use Ancestry.com? Yeah, exactly, and I do too, yeah. It's, it's really helpful as a jumping off point. Um, however, they tend to have more federal records. They're starting to get in some more state records, but it's mainly federal, and like a lot of state, rec state archives, we don't have a cumulative database to search a name and get all of the records we have, um, like Ancestry does, um, just because of a funding issue. So the reference archivists, whether we're talking to you by email or if you're interacting with our websites we've created for you, um, it's meant to help you figure out what specific record type do you search to then try to find information. So it is determining the record type, as in, do you wanna search a death record and find something or a land record? So it's just good to keep that in mind. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from the book Still Alice, and it says, prioritizing hurt, a reminder that the clock was ticking, that some things would be left undone. And that's how I feel every day when I'm trying to do research and I see it with the, the clients that I work with, where a lot of times someone will come to me with a huge list of everything they wanna get done at once, which I'm the same way, I wanna do that too, but it's easy to lose track of it. So prioritizing your, your goals of research is really helpful. Um, let's move on here. So this kind of leads into the archives research room. We call that when you're here in person, our search room, but it does extend online when you're trying to research uh, the same principles. We have two main goals, to preserve, but also to make accessible for your research questions. Preservation means controlling the temperature in our storage, 
or scanning records to preserve the originals, but scanning them also makes it accessible either in person or online. Okay, so talking about the actual research, I do want to start with vital records because that's usually a top priority in trying to solve who are the parents, when did someone pass away, when were they born. Um, vital records are births, deaths, and marriages, but the date ranges vary within each state. For Maryland, they begin creating births in Baltimore City in 1875 and, and death records in Baltimore City in 1875. Those dates are actually the same when they start. They begin recording births and deaths in the counties. That means all of Maryland except Baltimore City. Not until 1898, so pretty late. Um, one thing we do, now I'm talking about the government records. One thing we do, um, prior to these dates is look at religious records and sometimes wills and other records. So we do brainstorm with you. Um, but you'll notice that for birth records, the time span that we can make accessible is fairly limited. We actually stop in 1924. And that is actually due to Maryland law. Um, so they restrict birth records for 100 years. And um, so technically, they're restricted up through 1919. But if you can provide proof of death, we can actually work on a research order with you and get you access to um, anything between 19, the 19 and 1924. Now, that's just talking about the original records that are not available from home. The good news is birth record indexes and all the indexes here are all available from home and they're not restricted you can get a ton of information that way. Um, deaths, we currently go up to the last 10 years, and the indexes go, I think, up to 2014. So you can do a lot of great research. And marriages technically go, go from the colonial era, era to 2011, um, but it's a little spotty in the colonial era, so we tend to use uh, religious records. Um, I do want to delve into this a little bit more, but are there any questions right now? Yeah, we do have a question. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. <coughs> I have a great-grandfather that died, <laughs> um, and I want to find his parents. Is there any yeah. birth records back that far? So what we, do you know about when he passed away? Or did he, did he die in Maryland, or was he just born in Maryland? Um, he was born in Maryland. Moved to Middletown, Maryland, um, and lived there until he died in 1888. Okay, so for this time frame with government records, it's too early for, for the government records because he dies prior to 1898. But what we would do is try to figure out if uh, he and his family attended uh, a religious institution they and did. see if we can track. Yes, if you, do you know what religious institution he might have attended? Was, um, I think it was um, either a Methodist or Lutheran church. I don't have that information. But he, if you know where he lives, so what I'm going to provide at the very end of the presentation is our email, because I'm going to encourage you to email uh, when he was born and passed away and the area he lived in and the denomination, a Methodist or Lutheran, to us, so we can see if we have religious records that could help you. And some of our religious records are online. Sometimes they're still with the religious uh, institution and we could connect you to them. Right. Um, so that would probably be the best bet for his time frame to get okay. his parents. And there's a few other things we can try if you strike out with that. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So these dates are just government. Thankfully, religious institutions were much better at recording uh, births and deaths and marriages prior to that. Um, and we're going to actually delve into that further. So um, because birth, death, and marriage records are so popular, understandably, we're working on revamping our website to have more uh, helpful user guides. Um, so uh, one, well, and actually I should back up. So one issue with many archives catalogs is they're hierarchical 
and it's different than a library catalog. So hierarchical means you need to know the agency, and then if there's a smaller department, and then the time frame and what the record was called to actually get to the series, which you can't know what you don't know. So we create finding aids to actually make it accessible to normal people because it's I've worked here 11 years and I still get lost with our, our catalog. Um, so I'm going to show you a few things. Um, if we go to, um, and I'll give you our web address, but Maryland State Archives online, you can even go to Google and type in Maryland State Archives. Um, it takes you to our web page. The guide to government records under our quick links is where we're placing, well, it, it has cataloged all of our government records, but this is where we put finding aids that are very user friendly. Um, and I do want to point out that for vital records, it is very helpful for tracing lineage, providing dates, but we also serve a lot of people who are dealing with legal emergencies. They might need a marriage for social security or pension, passport, immigration, things like that. They might be looking into family medical history and need death certificates for that. So these are very much in demand in being able to do this research. So when you go to our guide to government records and you click on our reference and research tab, it brings up research guides. I tend to um, focus people on the birth, death, and marriage. That's what we're working on uh, revamping right now, but our next project will be probate records creating a guide uh, or a finding aid for that, as in wills. So the first one I'm going to take us to are the, there's the birth records. This page um, does have a way for you to place an order from home for an actual original copy or a copy of an original record, but it also has a find record link where it will take you at home to the actual indexes broken up by Baltimore City, which you might see at the very bottom of, of the screen, Baltimore City or the counties. Now your handouts for birth records, you can download them right off this page as well. They're the same handouts, they're really helpful. When you um, use these pages at home, you're going to see indexes like this. This is the counties index for births. It is all of the counties together, and it's purely by last name. What I love about that is you don't have to know where someone's born. You just need to search by name. And it's broken down to, into smaller date ranges, so it's really helpful. Baltimore City has separate indexes for births. And Baltimore City is, a, I have a love-hate relationship for the, with their indexes. You'll see these indexes with, they also, oh, so the previous one, purely alphabetical. Baltimore City goes by the first letter of the last name, and then someone decided it would be fun to go by the first occurring vowel, and then go chronologically. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a misguided effort to narrow down how much you had to look at. So if you know the first, you know, first letter of the last name, first occurring vowel, and you only have to check part of the C's. But when I explain it to a patron, like a client who's come in, I'm like, I'm going to explain this to you. I'm going to sound crazy, but just stick with me. So um, that's why I also give you our email and website and phone number. If you're ever using indexes and you get stuck, because, uh, contact us. <laughs> so we don't really create our own indexes. We try to learn about and interpret the indexes that were created historically. And a lot of times what made sense to a clerk who was working day in and day out, they didn't really think ahead and say, well, this makes sense to someone 100 years from now. <laughs> but the good thing is when you look at these indexes, whether it's Baltimore City or uh, the counties, you get parents' names, and sometimes you'll even get the child's name, so you can get a great amount of research uh, and the exact date of birth, so you get that research from home. Okay, so moving on. Oh, any questions at this point? So I know I'm kind of going through fast. No, no questions. Okay, so for, um, I do want to mention, okay, for death records, 
We are in the middle of revamping the death records website. So until that happens, we're giving out cheat sheets, which are among your handouts, that will help you uh, get to the death record indexes from home. The cheat sheet looks like this, where it takes you to the guide to government records and has you find a jump by series box. And a series is just a collection number. The little cheat sheet gives you a series or collection number for the indexes for different periods of time. So you can type in your shortcut, you can get to that index. And hopefully in the next few months, our, um, our webs our, the committee, which I'm on to for developing better finding aids, it should debut on the website. This is just temporary. Um, but you can search all the way back from the 18, late 1800s up to about 2014 for the indexes. Okay, so I also want to, oh, there we go. So this is, give you a quick screenshot. So when you go to our home page and you click on the guide to government records, there is our jump by series box. That's where you put the collection number or series to jump to the different death record indexes. Now, if you try to get to the shortcut for the death certificates themselves, it's not gonna come up because of our funding limitations. You can place an order through our website if you'd like, or if you ever were planning a trip out here, you can get in person and print them for a dollar a page. So, um, but the indexes are quite helpful. Um, now, marriage records. We also have a finding aid we just debuted, which we're excited about, which looks very similar to the birth records. Marriages are one of our most complicated uh, collections because they vary drastically by time frame, by county, all of that. So that is why you really need to take debut this finding aid that walks you through uh, the time frame, what county it's filed in, and we'll actually tell you if there is an index. Um, before 1914, there are quite a few indexes to marriages. Going back to the late 1700s, 1800s, for instance, this Baltimore County marriage index actually transcribes all of the information that's on the marriage record. So for uh, anything before 1914 is not gonna be a certificate, like the full page certificate. It's gonna be a single line ledger entry, and that is the official marriage record. So the indexes transcribe everything. So even though technically only indexes are available from home, you really are getting to the information on the original record this way. Um, and, it, and also there is a minister listed. So, that is a great way to actually get to church records if you don't already know the church because we can help you find out what church did that minister serve in. Um, so there are a lot of good things about the marriage records. Now, after 1951, there's a statewide index. So, um, and I should clarify, pre-1914, and uh, there's... Uh, it's kind of county by county, unfortunately. Um, after 1951, it goes statewide. And you probably noticed that I skipped a chunk of years. I went from 1914 to 51. And that's because in that gap, there's a lot of missing indexes or indexes that weren't created. So long story short, if you ever get stuck with your research, you can email us and we can help you find out, is there an index that will suit your needs? Um, especially World War II era, they were having a hard time keeping up with all of this, the marriages and, and things like that going on. Um, but you'll notice from the indexes, you can get maiden names through the marriage indexes. So it's, it's very helpful. Um, how is everyone doing? I know I'm kind of moving fast because I want to squeeze a lot of great information in, but any questions? So, no. Okay, good. So uh, we're talking about um, birth, death, and marriage. And I do want to delve into probate records. One of the reasons that I want to mention that is they're very helpful prior to the creation of death records to learn more about family members. Um, so it can give you the date someone died, which is wonderful, but it also says who did a person interact with, who are they 
bequeathing property to, and even if they died without a will, in Maryland, you have to, in most places, you have to file inventories of what they owned. And one of my favorite records, it seems very dry, but it's awesome, are administration accounts. Those are accounts of who received what from an, from an estate. So we've been able to discover names of children, names of siblings, things that were not otherwise known about a person. So uh, they are wonderful. And the best news about probate records is some of the original records are actually, we actually got some funding to put, funding to put online from home. So I'm gonna talk about that. Um, the way probate records are organized in Maryland is we have one wonderful master index for colonial probate records. And that's, well, 1777 earlier. Um, it's just a name index and it will tell you the book and page a will is filed in and it will also mention the other types of records. After 1777 and onwards, Register of Wills is filed county by county. Um, and those records have indexes online, but not the actual records. Um, but that single searchable index for probate records for the colonial period will lead you to the actual wills online from home. So definitely worth keeping that in mind. Um, and if you contact us through the help desk, we're happy to give you extra help with searching probate records because they still can be a little bit of a challenge. And we hope to have probably by the end of the year, if not early next year, a new finding aid dedicated specifically to that. Okay, so um, moving on from probate records, the theme so far has been indexes are online for the most part, mostly original records you have to be here or place an order. Maryland land records, move here, there we go. Uh, Maryland land records, they're all online. The indexes, the actual records, whether it's a deed, a mortgage, indentured servitude, manumission, certificates of freedom, they are all online, which we are very excited about. And that is, I had mentioned, we have some limitations in funding, so the Maryland Judiciary and General Assembly funded this and it goes from the oldest land records in Maryland up to the last couple of weeks of modern deeds. So there is a handout that is for mdlandrec.net. And if you look at that handout, there are bullet points on the first page. Those bullet points talk about searching historical land records the rest of the, the guide talks more about modern land records. So if you're doing ge older genealogy, focus on those bullet points and they'll help you search name indexes, get the book and page something is filed on and look at the actual deed. Now I will say I use land records a lot, but I don't use them that much for the land itself. Um, I use it more again when it comes to genealogy to find out who someone interacted with. Um, I was able to discover that a man had a son we didn't know about because he sold his property to his son. And so it fills in a lot of blanks. Um, it also helped me once when I was researching, I thought I was researching two different people, Enoch Howard and George Howard, but land records helped me discover he was alternating between his first name and his middle name. And I'd been researching one person the whole time. <laughs> so it's a very helpful website. It's also great because, especially in the colonial and 19th century, mid to early 19th century, they, uh, they didn't have as many courts as we have now. They filed a lot of records through the land office that were not land. So we've done research on African Americans in Maryland and people who were buying their own freedom, um, certificates of freedom, or purchasing family members to free them through land records, that is all online. So extremely helpful um, in doing family research and historical research. And again, this all from home completely. Okay, that does bring up 
the um, study of the legacy of slavery in Maryland, that is through our website. And if you type in legacy of slavery in Maryland in Google, it's going to come up. This is a grant funded uh, research project that draws not only from land records, but also newspapers, um, census records, uh, newspaper ads of buying or selling or someone who's fled. It is uh, even military records, things that really can help build more information. And so it is a free website. Um, since it's grant funded, they don't have all of the counties, but quite a few. So a fantastic website, and which I will met, go circle back to a little bit later about. Um, now, court records I want to mention briefly, just because they, they are helpful in things like, um, it can be divorces or criminal records, anything that gives you more of a of what kind of footprints your ancestors left throughout history. Um, a very common complaint from genealogists I work with is their ancestors were too well behaved and they're not finding anything about them. So court records can be a big help. Um, the only unfortunate thing about court records is they are, the collections of them are massive. I mean, we have record center boxes here and in our gigantic offsite warehouse that are so massive, we just don't have the staff to scan them. Um, but we do have some indexes online we could connect you with. If you can email us with like the specific, or even general time frame and where you think someone lived. Um, but they're a little limited with what's online. So as um, to kind of, make up for that, a really good website is Archives of Maryland Online. It doesn't have so much modern court records, but it has a lot of judicial, legislative um, records from the colonial period up through a little bit more recently. And the reason for that is they're trying to document the um, records that really helped found Maryland's government um, you can get to fairly recent acts of the General Assembly, but it can really be helpful if you're trying to find, say, a court record from the colonial period. They actually had to file divorces through the General Assembly of Maryland um, so in the colonial period. So you will find some court records there, and you can search the entire site. It has um, some military records, executive records of the gov governor, and things like that. So um, Archives of Maryland Online is a little misleading because it sounds like it's our entire Archives Online, which it's not. It's the name of a volume set, a very large volume set, almost an encyclopedia that we've digitized. Um, so definitely keep that on your radar. Rachel, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, on the Archives of Maryland uh, Online, if you open up any one of those, uh, mm -hmm. is it keyword searchable? Or are they indexed in any way, shape, or form? Yes. So there's a few ways you can search it. If you click on a, one of the volumes, it will have a search bar where you can search because they've been transcribed, um, which is fantastic. You also have, I think, unfortunately, my screenshot didn't cut it off a little bit, but there's going to be a search bar for the entire site on the top right as well. So yes, you can search the volumes, um, and you can search the entire site. So that helps you kind of uh, being able to search the volumes can help you narrow it down by time frame. And the menu on the left hand side, that can help you go by category, which can help narrow things down as well. I see. Now, once you're in and you, you can you can do a keyword search, do you use just traditional Boolean searching strategies like quotation marks to keep the words in order, that kind of thing? I'm glad you asked that question because unfortunately, it's very. Um, it is limited. We created this, I want to say, in the 90s and we ha and with our funding, and we unfortunately didn't get a chance to update it yet. Um, so it's very simple in that it doesn't really get quotation marks, but if you put in a string of keywords, it will search for those keywords in a document. Um, if you put in and or or, it will literally look for the words and and or. So <laughs> unfortunately, it's not as intelligent as that. Um, but that's on our wish list to someday have updated. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Good question. Okay, so we've I've, I tried to bring up the um, really top collections that are most helpful with Maryland 
uh, genealogical research that are government records, um, especially the ones you can get to from home. But I'd love to delve into our special collections, which are non-government records. And our special collections, so I should actually back up a bit. So for government records, we actively um, work with agencies to bring in these records, to establish um, collections with them, things like that. Special collections, um, people and, institu and private institutions have to approach us and say, I'm choosing to donate this to the Maryland State Archives. Um, so it can vary. Sometimes with religious records, we might have a collection or they might have chosen to donate their collection to like a local historical society. So, um, but again, the contact information I'll give you, you can always contact us and we can try to find out who has what collection. Uh, that said, we have very, a very vibrant collection of special collections. So that can include um, cartographic collections, maps and drawings. It can have uh, photographs, journals, diaries, newspapers, um, and religious records and other types of records. So like we had talked about uh, earlier, they're especially useful for the time frame when vital records are a bit limited. Okay, and one of my favorite collections that we have online are the historical photographs of Maryland. Now, it's not all of our photographic collections because it's pretty vast, but we've been working on processing more and more and posting them online, which you can search by keyword. The, um, you can go to our homepage, and it is on our homepage, or you can type in the web address, which is histpix.msa.maryland.gov. Um, and it brings up some wonderful varieties of collections. Now, one of the top questions I get when it comes to historical photographs is, can I search for my ancestor's name and find a photograph of them. So the way that our catalog for the for special collections for photographs works is we uh, catalog what the photographer gave us as information. So for instance, this photograph, the photographer wrote on the back that it was four women in front of um, a famous local DJ, Hoppy Adams Carr, on Cars Beach, which was a segregated beach in Maryland that had a very strong history and um, many photographs that really are a time capsule. But the sad thing is, we, we as an ar ar the archivist here, we don't know the names of the women in this photograph. But someone who's doing family research, if they search Cars Beach, they may recognize an ancestor. And I think I see a hand up. Yes. Oh, I'm. I think I'm losing. I'm so sorry. I'm only getting a few a few bits of what you're saying. Oh, she wants to know the website of how to access the photographs. Right. Yes, I'm going to back. Let me actually back up one second. So, you can either go to Google and type in historical photographs of Maryland. There's a link on our homepage, but you can also write down. Um, and this is how I get to it is. Hist pics, as in history pictures. So hist pics, h i s t p i c s dot m s a, as in Maryland State Archives, dot maryland dot gov. And Suzanne, uh, I think you had mentioned the webinar will be made available to everyone afterwards too. Correct. Oh, awesome. Okay, so that link will be in the slides of the webinar as well. And yes, it's a great resource. Any other questions um, right now? Okay, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anyone or anything. Okay, um, so again, a lot of, there's not many photographs that, are, that actually have a person's name, so we encourage people to search for areas that they know ancestors or, or people lived in, um, and you can find great photographs that way. Another example here is women in a canoe on the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, and we don't have their names. But again, searching areas people lived in, um, uh, famous landmarks like the canal, and you're starting to get photographs of people throughout history. Um, oh, and 
that's probably the most common question of how do I find my ancestors photograph. The second most common, um, it's people trying to research an historical building, whether it's a place they're living or a place maybe an ancestor lived. And they'll usually say, if I type in the street address, will I find the building in your photographs? Well, usually not. We often aren't, don't have the street address in the photographs, but we always try to put the street. So for instance, we have an unknown photographer. We actually don't know who took this awesome photo, um, but we know it's a leather goods store on Baltimore Street. So if you knew the street someone lived on from say land records, and you search that street name in our photographs, you never know what you're gonna find. Um, build, uh, architectural historians use our collections quite a bit as well if they're restoring a building to get it back to its original, original state. And I love this photograph, especially the huge wobbly trunk that's advertising what their store is. Okay, so we've um, talked about photographs. Um, newspapers also, fantastic uh, resource for genealogy. Um, another good resource uh, for the time frame prior to birth and death records, because you can find baptismal announcements, birth, marriage, death announcements. Um, in these records. Now, not all of our newspapers are digitized. Most of them are scanned um, when you come and visit us in person. So in order to try to make these resources more available from home, um, our director of special collections, Maria Day, who's awesome, um, she's been working with the Universities of Maryland to uh, create a partnership where they would help us pro help provide funding, also um, take some of the newspapers in their own collections and ours and put more and more of them online from home. Um, and that's something with, with state archives, state historical societies, county level uh, societies and libraries where when funding is limited, which is a very common issue for, for many institutions, partnerships are hugely helpful. So if you go to our home page um, at the Maryland State Archives and you click on find records on that top blue bar on the home page and it's highlighted in yellow here um, if you click on find records it brings up under the browse by record a list of our catalogs and there's the Guide to Government Records, there's the Maryland Land Records, but Special Collections, there's the home page for that. If you click on it, it will then take you, there we go, um, to where you can click, where you'll actually see a, a tabs along the very top of the Special Collections home page, where it says Home, Biographies, Maps, Newspapers, Photos, and Religious Records. And if you click on the newspapers, on the left, well actually, and I'll explain what this home page says. So you can browse by title, date, time frame, county. That's more helpful when you're here in person um, because it takes you to what's available online, um, available on site. So instead, on the left hand side, on that menu where it says special collections home, browse newspapers, and then it says digital newspapers. You click on digital newspapers, it takes you to what we do have online from home. And it's alphabetical by the newspaper's title. When this project for, or partnership first started, we had eight. Now it's gotten to this point, and I'll show you how much we have. Oh, wow. I mean, it's it's a lot, and it's from many, it's many different counties. So if you see uh, Queen Anne's record, that's Eastern Shore, Maryland. And then we have St. Mary's Enterprise, which is Southern Maryland on the Western Shore. We have Montgomery Independent and Mount Montgomery County Sentinel, which are very close to DC. So you can really do a lot of research for Maryland, um, genealogy and history through this. One thing I will mention about looking through historic Maryland newspapers, and you may all have already run into this yourself with just newspapers in general, um, these are not, these are actually not text searchable. You have to browse them. Um, 
it's there's many things on our wish list, you know, to someday maybe have them transcribed, but currently they're not text searchable. So what I've done when I've been researching them is if you browse a few issues, you start to pick up on where, what page they have the ads on, what page tends to have local news, and after a while you, you're able to browse fairly quickly knowing what page to kind of return to with each issue. So they can be very helpful. Um, and I would highly recommend you taking advantage of this, this resource. Uh, Rachel, I have a question. Um, sure. Does your, does your archive work with Chronicling America at the National Archive or the Library of Congress? I, be I believe so. I'm not positive. That would be a good question for me to check with Maria Day on, um, because I know she's had different partnerships over time. Um, I'm not sure. I'll see if I can find out, and I'll let you know so you can pass it on to, to everyone. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. And um, so we talked about photographs and newspapers. Um, I do want to mention religious records because we've we've mentioned that a quite a bit uh, in our talk so far because um, religious records are great for that period prior to births and deaths. Or this can happen too, where we find a death record for someone. Um, this is actually an example that actually happened to me yesterday and happens quite a bit where someone's born before they're creating birth records. So let's say it's 1850 that they're born. And since Baltimore City doesn't start till 1875 and the rest of Maryland don't start till 1898, there's no government birth record. But they, let's say they die in 1930. We found the death record and the informant who was providing, or who was a family member who was providing the information didn't know or was just distraught and could not recall the names of the parents. We pull up the death certificate and it says unknown for father and unknown for mother. So we still were back to square one. So the religious records are great prior to births and deaths, but they're also great for filling in the gaps for unknown information. Now on our website, you'd still go to our homepage and go to our special collections homepage and there's the religious records tab. Now you can browse just by the title of the church or by the denomination or the county. Um, it can be information overload, which is why you can always email us or call us. Um, but for instance, I searched for All Hallows Parish in Anne Arundel County, and we fortunately have quite a few collections from them. Just like with the newspapers, our director of special collections has been trying to get more and more of the church records, religious records, online from home. She is an she runs an incredible department of two people, so it's it's slow going. But for instance, here you'll notice the links. If you see an active link under a church records collection, you can get to it from home. So even though yeah, even though it's it uh, kind of varies for each church, we're trying to get them get them online. Um, okay, and speaking of. Let me make sure I did. Uh, one second. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So when it comes to religious records, you can browse by title, county, date frame. But honestly, one thing I do want to bring up is we list in our re uh, religious records guide all of the historical churches we know of existing in Maryland's history, and they actually put on the um, on the collection if we have a collection ourselves. If there's no link to collections like this, just please contact us because we can try to find out who does have the collection to try to help you in your research. Okay, so um, the last uh, special collection type that I want to mention, which has been really helpful to research, um, are our maps. What I'm showing on the screen here, um, this is a map from 1850 by J.C. Sidney. Um, it's a map of Baltimore County. And what's wonderful about this map is what it shows in comparison to earlier maps. Um, when we look at maps prior to the mid 1800s, they might show rivers, towns, you know, maybe a railway. They don't tend to show where people live. Starting around 1850 into the 1860s, there are several cartographers uh, Sydney, there was also a cartographer whose last name is Martinet, who 
we're creating these highly detailed maps of each county and district of each county of Maryland, and people could pay to have their names listed on the map. So it is really a gold mine. Um, there's plenty, plenty of times when you're going to be researching someone who decided, I don't want to pay to have my name on the map, and they're not on there. But that's where census records can really help. So if you can find census records from the 1850s and 60s and make a note of the neighbors near the person you're, you're researching, chances are, in my experience, that at least one of them had their name put on the map. So if you can't find the person you're researching, you will probably find a neighbor who's going to still help you place where they're living. Um, it's also been helpful for archaeologists because there can be churches and historic schoolhouses, cemeteries, things that no longer stand and have been buried literally underground that they can now find where they stood. So they're helpful in so many ways. Um, <clears throat> and these maps, 1850s, 1860s, they are available online from home because, going back to partnerships, the study of the legacy of slavery through their grants have made the interactive maps, we call them the interactive maps, made them available online from home through their website. So you'd want to go to study of the legacy of slavery, interactive maps, and you would click on that and select the county, going all the way down through the, the levels of detail. Um, it's also called interactive because if um, we were able to build a biography, um, through the, the research grants for the study of the legacy of slavery, if we were able to build a biography, then if you click on that person's name, you'll be able to see if a biography has been generated. Or I shouldn't say generated. It's, not, it's done by <laughs> blood, sweat, and tears. Um, but you'll be able to see the biographies there, and it's, it's really a great, a great resource. Um, any questions before I move on? I always ask because I'm, uh, I'm a little paranoid that I'm going to miss someone who's at the corner farther from me. So, <laughs> Okay, so um, we covered go uh, government records, special collections. Um, a reminder when you're doing your research, you're a detective and be proud of it. Um, keep lists of what you find. And also, and I can say this as a reference archivist where I've learned the hard way, and I try to pass it on to people. Um, what you don't find is just as important as what you do find. So if you, let's say you've been researching death indexes year by year, or you've been going through marriage records, um, keeping a list of where you don't find information so you don't accidentally go back and have to redo it. So that can be a real help, especially with our indexes where you're not going to be able to type in a name and get to everything, you do have to often go through chunks of time frames and years. So it'll, it'll definitely help you keep, keep things organized. And um, so I hope that is really helpful. I do want to make sure that you have our website um, and email address, which is our, our website is msa.maryland.gov. And I'm also giving you our email. The email is on the website. But I really want to make sure you have it as well. So it is msa, as in Maryland State Archives, and uh, that's dot help desk, one word together, at maryland.gov. Now the um, the phone number on our website, it's a general number that would take you to um, a menu to make selections. I'm giving you the number that goes directly to people. We are a small but mighty staff, so sometimes you have to leave a voicemail or you might have to call back occasionally, but we work really hard on answering all of your calls and questions, so you can always call us. Um, but I would actually recommend starting with um, the email, especially if it's for genealogy, because it really helps us to be able to look through your email at the information you're providing so we can really look in depth in, in helping you. So email is actually best just for us to communicate with you and really assist you. Um, and one other thing I did want to mention, if you go to our home page, which you can do um, through Google, just going to Maryland State Archives, you can type that into Google or you can go to our, type in our website. There are links to um, Facebook um, and several other social media accounts 
at the very bottom of our page, there's an email list that you can subscribe to. We never spam you or send you a million things. You just get usually a monthly newsletter if there's um, perhaps something new has been posted online or there's a special event or things like that that would be interesting to be um, kept abreast of. We also have volunteer programs. Many of them are on site, but there is a volunteer program for actually helping us transcribe records that don't have indexes that you can even do from home. So stay on our email list, check it out our website. There's a lot of resources uh, that can be interesting. Um, so thank you so much for uh, letting me speak. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, we do have some questions. Go ahead. Is there any kind of list of um, passengers, ships from the early 1700s? Whatever. Yeah, so for, I'm sorry, for immigrants coming over in the early 1700s, ship yes. manifest, right? So although we don't have uh, a lot of ships manifests, one thing that's very helpful is um, there's a few things that are helpful. Newspapers have helped us a ton in that time frame for discovering when people are arriving and when ships are arriving. Another thing is the Early Settlers of Maryland. That is through our Guide to Government Records that you can search, and it will list people who are settlers as well as the lists of other people who are immigrating, whether it's indentured servants, et cetera, who are coming in. Um, another resource would be, um, actually, the, those are probably the top two resources. The last resource we have is naturalization and immigration indexes. The only issue is those are a bit spotty in the colonial period because they didn't keep very strong uh, records of that. Now, one thing that might help um, is I know the National Archives and I believe the Baltimore City Archives have some ships manifests, but a lot of them didn't survive. So we tend to look through uh, the Early Settlers of Maryland Index to see what we can find. Um, and we also sometimes even look at land records because they might list people who are coming into work land and things like that. So we have to kind of use some plan Bs. And if you could ever, if you could email us even uh, your question of who you're trying to find, we could help you even brainstorm further. Wonderful. Any other, does that, does that help? Yes. Oh, good. Any, Any other? Yeah. And more questions? Okay, I, I have a few questions. Oh, um, please. When you send in an email request for assistance, for research assistance, um, does it acknowledge, like does it open up a ticket and then you get like a, an email in return saying that you know, uh, your email's been received? You know, because I do a lot of emailing of libraries and archives in my research, and I found that some sites will acknowledge that, you know, that you know, you've submitted it and you, know, you don't have to sit there and click 10 times wondering you know, if it's submitted or not. It, what is the, you know what is the response after you click on email to the help desk? So there's a couple of things. If if you're in mdlandrec.net and you send an email through that about land record research, you do get a response back saying you received it. For the help desk, you would actually send that through your own email account, and we don't actually have an automated response yet to come back. We are working on trying to respond quickly just to let you know we got your email. And that, that would be a human being responding, but we're working on trying to keep, keep you um, up to date, even if we're still looking into your question. We'll try to follow up with you and say, oh, we'll be in touch with you soon. We're looking into this. So um, MD Landrick does send you a generated response. We're pretty quick with our turnaround time with the general help desk emails. And so you will be hearing back from someone usually within a couple of business days or so. Great, great. Okay, then I have a couple of more questions. Um, just generally speaking, this is more of a librarian question. Um, just generally speaking, about how what's the percentage on a daily basis of you have your genealogy questions versus non-genealogy questions? So we've we've tried to calculate that before too, and it seems to be about 50-50, maybe weighted a little bit heavier towards genealogy. But what we find is for genealogy questions, we get a lot of new people each day, but there's also a lot of long-term researchers um, who are either emailing us or coming in person um, repeatedly. For legal questions, it's usually a one-time visit. So someone just needs that one legal document. So the number of people tend to be higher for legal requests, but it kind of still balances out. 
So it's about 50-50. Okay. Now, if someone was to like go visit Maryland, like for instance, I have relatives in, in Baltimore, and if I were gonna go visit them and I wanted to stop by your archives, what would be your advice that I should bring with me? Okay, so there's a, a few things I could suggest. Um, well, first, I'll, I'll give you our hours, and those are on our website, but we're Tuesdays through Fridays, 8.30 to 4.30, and we are open the first Saturday of each month currently. And what we recommend is, um, so if you can bring names, dates, and locations, and prioritize your top, you know, your number one question, but then keep your list of other things you want to discover, but it's really names, dates, and places that you happen to know, and it does not have to be exact, just a jumping off point. Um, our search room has, um, we've started to implement best practices for archives as far as safety. Um, so we do have people lock up things like bags, folders, and notepads. So if you can bring like a small steno pad to keep notes on, uh, we also give you note paper. So um, also we encourage people to bring their cell phones, cameras, laptops. If you have a lot of things like saved on, through Ancestry or on your computer, definitely bring your laptop or iPad or even just your cell phone and camera because we encourage you to use your laptop, but also we encourage people to take pictures of our records as long as your flash is off. So I know some, some, there are some places that don't allow photography, we highly encourage it. And we even have a small photo stand with really good lighting to photograph records. So definitely bring a camera or a camera phone. Do you have high speed? Do you have a high speed available? Uh, spice, uh, high speed inner, I'm sorry, I, I, I lost the audio for a second. Oh, um, do you have high speed scanners? So we do, um, now it kind of varies. So when, someone, when something's been scanned already, so for instance, a lot of our probate records and vital records, newspapers, things like that, are scanned and on the computers, which you can just print for a dollar a page or you can photograph off the screen. Um, but we do have uh, quite a few high-speed scanners that provide excellent images for orders. The one thing to uh, be aware of is if you decide to order um, uh, like a, a high-quality image of something, um, there are fees involved just because we're not fully supported by tax dollars. Um, and the fees are the same in person or if you place an order from home. So if you say wanted to order a copy of a marriage certificate or um, a court record or things like that, the fees are 25 to $35. That does include the paper, uh, certified paper copies and an electronic image sent to your email if you ask for that. Um, when people come here in person, we try to do a lot of scanning when they're there in our search, our staff search room scanner. It's not a patron scanner. Um, we'd love to eventually have one in the search room for our patrons, but we're trying to see if we can get the money for that. Um, so for now, it's a staff scanner. And we also have an entire scanning department that can deal with oversized materials that produce beautiful images. And also, do you have uh, like like uh, like a traditional library? Do you have like books on family histories, like particular surnames, that kind of thing? Yes. So we have a wonderful. Uh, it's a non-circulating library. So although unfortunately the books cannot be checked out, it's a great local resource if you can come in person um, to look at. There are um, books on family names. There are also books on areas such as. Uh, cemetery records of Anne Arundel County or uh, Revolutionary War records, things like that. Um, and so there's also books on women's, women's history, African American history, um, War of 1812, Revolutionary War. It really, there's a huge variety and our librarian has been ordering more. <laughs> so um, it's a vibrant collection that you can actually search on our home page if you click on Find Records the same place you get to our special collections catalog. It will get you to our library catalog to see what we have. And there's a lot of books that are even out of print. So our library includes books that are uh, modern books, 21st century publications, um, and research materials, all the way back to books that were published in the 1700s and 1800s. So you can get a really nice uh, variety of library resources that you may not even be able to find elsewhere. 
or or you can find them on Amazon for a, I've looked them up for hundreds of dollars. So it's a good free resource if you can come in person. Now, for the books that are out of print, are there any uh, plans? You know, uh, of course, funding of, uh, available, um, you know, as a provision. But are there sure. any plans to digitize any of those out of out of copyright books? So I know that's that is a hope for our librarian. She has actually been working on digitizing some of the more modern ones. But I, I do want to give you a resource because it's so our, our library department is actually one person. It's our librarian and she's incredible, but she's one person. So she um, has to prioritize what she's doing. And sometimes digitization just, you know, cannot happen as quickly as she hopes. So a great resource is archive.org. And that is uh, an online resource where they're trying to scan these out of print books um, and get them online. And I'm finding more and more of these out of print Maryland resources on that website. So um, it's either, it's archive.org. If you type it in Google, it might say archive it. Um, but definitely look into that. It's a good resource from home for sure. Okay, and then I, I don't did I don't believe you covered adoption records, did you? Ah, uh, I didn't. You know, I meant to. Thank you so much. So um, adoption records are there are some legal constraints. So adoptions are actually sealed starting June first, nineteen forty seven onward, up, up to the present day. Prior to that, um, they are just among our equity records, which are like civil records, and. They're not restricted. They are not online, but the indexes are. They're just equity indexes. Now, one thing to keep in mind is mid-1900s and earlier, we have noticed that sometimes um, <laughs> adoptions are not formalized. Sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't, but they're not as stringent. But if an adoption occurred, you can contact us because there's a different index for um, equity records, including adoptions, pre-1947 for each county, and also a separate one for Baltimore City that we could uh, make available to you. If you emailed us, we could get you the right collection and everything, because it really varies um, by time frame and, and county, and we could help you search those to see what you could find in our indexes. If you found something that looked like a, a possible match, you actually can place an order um, if it's a case that's more than 20 pages, it's actually a $50 fee for us to scan the entire case and send that those scans to you. Um, under that, it's just $25. Um, but it can be a really great resource if it was formalized, for sure. And then I wanted to, uh, to thank you for what a great tip that was on the, um, the minister's name on the extracted uh, marriage records. To, to look for more church records under that minister's name. I thought that was an, an excellent tip. Oh, thank you, absolutely. And I, I should mention, um, I have not found this book online yet, but um, people have contacted us by email and we can check it for you. Um, in, our, in our library, we have a two volume set of a book called uh, Maryland's Ministers and the Churches They Served by Agnes Canely, and that's K-A-N, E L Y, um, and she is uh, she's incredible with what she created because you can go alphabetically by the ministers' names and see what churches they served for different time frames. And it goes from I want to say mid 16 or late 1600s up to the 1990s. So it's really really thorough. Wow, <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> It's that one of my favorite. <laughs> every day. It's one of my favorite resources, and obviously, it's not. It may not be online, but you could always email us. If you let's say one of you is looking at our online indexing and you see a minister's name, please contact us by email. We'll see. We'll check the book for you and see who's what church it is. And then I have one. I have one last question. Uh, I'm curious about the administration accounts. Uh, would it be sure. possible for you to to uh, open up one and show what everyone you know show everybody what it looks like? Yeah, let me see that if it if I can do this on a screen grab. Hold on one second here. Okay. Now, does everyone still see my screen? Uh, I, we see a, a gray screen, but um, I'm not sure what your screen is showing right now. Yeah, uh, let me try. Uh, I'm going to try Firefox and see if maybe that lets us. Okay. Uh, 
I know it seemed to be uh, angry at Chrome earlier, so <laughs> let's see. One second here. Okay, now we see a blue screen. Ah. So, try this. Okay, I'm going to open Firefox and see if it sees it. If not, could I email you an image to share with the class? If yeah, it turns no out problem. I could be more than happy to do that. I'm just I curious can, to see what one looks like. I will. I'll, I, what I'll actually do is I will email you an image so you can see what it looks like. And if you have the contact, do you have the contact info for everyone in the class to uh, um, send it out to them? Yes, I do have an email list. 